uh, you are part of the vaccination. Yeah, um, I got my vaccine on, um, I guess it was Thursday. Um, right. And uh, happy that I also was able to get 20 of my staff to go get vaccinated. That's about over 50% of our, uh, well over 50% of our staff uh, put their hand up. And uh, um, in addition to that, we have these six that had act the actual infection over the past few months at different times. So um, our clinic is probably over 70%, at least once we're vaccine immune, we'll have over 70% of our staff having either the vaccine or the actual infection. And uh, we hope we can get a couple ex uh, others vaccinated uh, um, over the next round or two. Mm -hmm. and how, so how are you feeling? How's your staff feeling since uh, taking the vaccine last Thursday? Yeah, we were, we were all uh, communicating uh, over the course of the, uh, the first two days or so afterwards. And almost everybody said they had the sore arm. Classic, every, the same things everybody else has been saying, the sore arm. There were maybe two people that had like fatigue um, and uh, one person that had a fever um, or, or just for the first night. Um, but so far, I haven't heard of anything more serious than that, um, you know, other than what I've read in the, in the news reports. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we, we I, of course, I, I recommended that my all of my staff take the vaccine, but I definitely, uh, I, I, I left it up to them. Vaccine hesitancy is a real thing. And I think um, if you're going to, uh, shame people or um, uh, really challenge them. I think it, you're going to do more harm and having them dig their feet, feet in even more, you know, set the example. Um, and then with time, hopefully they become more comfortable with more data. And, um, you know, it's uh, just incredible. Um, this this vaccine rollout is, is historic and unprecedented. And I think we're going to have tremendous numbers that will hopefully make people more comfortable and confident that this is a safe vaccine mm -hmm. because it's uh you know having two to three thousand people die every day from covid that's that's what you have to measure the risks of the vaccine against and um the sooner we can get uh more people vaccinated the better mm -hmm. can you take uh, doctor i wanted to ask you we get a lot of questions uh, and concerns about uh Pregnant women, uh, women, ex you know, wanting to become pregnant. Uh, is that just lack of study for that group? Or is there something in the vaccine that just, you know, don't get it? Uh, like many things with uh, when it comes to medications and pregnancy, oftentimes we just don't know because it's not tested and because it's not necessarily ethical to test. So there are there are patients that were in the vaccine trials that, you know, they screened out for pregnancy, but some of them became pregnant um, or were pregnant, but didn't know it. <clears throat> and they did fine. So that's the only hard data we have right now. But um, the um, uh, American College of Gynecology, I believe, uh, has recommended that you allow um, pregnant uh, women to get the vaccine. And, and I know uh, there's some data out there already just over the first three days of vaccination that many hundreds of pregnant women have had the vaccine. So we'll have pretty good data, at least short-term data on, on, on this. Of course, it's going to take a long time before these women come to term, have babies, and make sure that not only is the maternal health there, but the, uh, the baby's health as well. Okay, so we're still learning uh, these things as we go. Uh, we There's a population that we know you're going to be fine, get the vaccine, but there's still, you know, like on kids uh, under 16 and the pregnant women, we just need to learn and get more data. I'm sorry, I, you, you, I lost you there for a second. Okay, sorry, just that, so it, it's just a matter of these studies and getting more data till we can make a determination. Yeah, that's that's it. We we need to um, we need to get more data. I, I think there's um, you know certain certainly uh, we think older kids are like adults, and and it would be very reasonable to assume that they're going to do fine with it. Um, but uh, until more data is available, and there are vaccine trial arms that haven't been reported yet that are ongoing where they do include kids. So uh, that data will come out probably um, as well. And each vaccine they have slightly different protocols in terms of who they include in their vaccine or not. So, uh, so we'll see. Um, but so far, very promising. Uh, I, I do, you know, I recognize the MRA vaccination technology isn't, isn't, uh, is, is the new kid on the block. It's not one of the more tried and true methods, but um, it has been around for, uh, for quite some time. And um, I think we're actually pretty fortunate that, that coronavirus happens to be 
a pretty good target of the mRNA vaccine. And, and um, maybe that's why previous vaccination attempts for different things hasn't worked out so well, but uh, so far it's looking good. I and mean, we've got some of the brightest people in the world that are scrutinizing the data to make sure that it's safe. And, it's, and, and they're, they're gonna call out anything that looks like a red flag to them. And I think that gives me a lot of uh, confidence. So Doc, I understand um, you, you have some new numbers, you've been crunching the numbers for us? I can, uh, yeah, I can go over a few slides with you okay. if you guys want. Yes, please. Um, just, uh, I'm trying to screen share here. Uh, um, I think Jason's got me on. Uh, oh, there you go. Uh, there we go. Okay, so uh, just, I, I, and I missed the the part of your, um, uh, the, the, the earlier part of your show, so I'm not sure what was reviewed already um, with uh, uh, the governor's uh, uh, spokesperson there, but um, based on the, the report that came out last night, we're closest to 1,400 vaccinations in Guam. And curiously, it's less than 1% of the population. So it's not a huge chunk of the population, but at least we got we got the healthcare workers, the ones that are gonna be on the front lines and, and potentially more at risk. And you know, to be able to keep that population safe, if we do, do have another surge and we won't have to have those people missing work or potentially affecting each other and, and, and other um, other patients. So again, that's the, the rationale to try to get to the healthcare workers first. Uh, but of course, we do need to quickly roll this out to a more vulnerable populations too. Um, uh, that 1,400 is about 20% or, or, or maybe actually closer to 30% actually um, of the total confirmed cases that we've had today, over 7,000. So um, I did read last night in, on a Bloomberg report that over 1.6 million people have been uh, vaccinated worldwide. Sorry for the typo there. And um, in the U.S., over 200,000. So that gives you some um, idea of the scale of what's going on uh, worldwide with these vaccinations. Big in the news over the past day, though, day or two, if you guys haven't seen this, there's a, a UK variant, um, possibly a strain. They're a little bit, um, the definitions can be a little bit um, uh, particular, but um, there, it's normal for the virus to, to mutate. We've talked about this in the past. Most of those mutations are not serious. Most of them actually would lead to less virulence um, because if, if, if the virus is more virulent, it's going gonna, it's gonna to burn itself out. We're going to identify it sooner. Um, so there is a, a variant that they've identified, which it, again, I, I'm very cautious when I do these things, um, but the people that I follow that I trust that are typically cautious, they're, they're starting to pay a lot more attention to this too. Um, and so much so that European countries, I think four of them now have stopped flights from the UK because early data is showing that this variant is um, increased, has an increased tendency to, tr uh, to be transmitted from one person to another. Um, and I, one number figure I saw was up, potentially up to 70%, which has huge uh, implication for this uh, re uh, you know, reproductive number uh, that we like to see, you know, less than one. And, it, you know, they've been quoting 2.3-ish for, for the COVID. Um, and it may increase it by 0.3 or 0.4 or more, uh, which just has a really profound, would have a profound impact on how well um, our, our, and our, you know, non-pharmacological interventions are able to control the transmission of this in the community. So this is going to be something very interesting to follow over the next few days. It's just amazing how they can get this data because they're they're analyzing the the, the genome of uh, the virus as it comes in in these new populations of people, and they're able to compare uh, the the you know the. Uh, they're able to compare the genetic variation from from previous versions to the current ones, and it's just it's just phenomenal um, that we have this level of granularity. Um, but the good news is, you know, we the current vaccines are very very likely to be effective, even if there are some changes. Um, but there are larger changes, uh, which we call antigenic drifts, which, in which the surface proteins um, will be sufficiently altered that we will have somewhat. In, in, uh, decreased immunity to them with either the vaccination or a natural immune system. So, and that's the big problem with influenza and why we have to change the vaccine so drastically every year. The influenza virus has very easily can have this antigenic drift, which requires a, a total new formulation. Thankfully for coronavirus, it's probably not going to be the case. Um, there are many, many that this spike protein, which allows it to enter your, your cells and your respiratory system. Uh, there are a lot of different regions. And so when your body mounts an attack to the spike protein, it can identify a lot of different regions on the spike protein. So you make antibodies to all, all these different parts of the spike protein. So um, again, so just something to, uh, to keep, keep an eye on. Um, I've been watching, there's a couple uh, different people that I follow also that estimate when, how soon can we get to herd immunity? You know, and that number, uh, 
uh, classically 60 to 80 percent. And um, this uh, 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 this gentleman I follow, he's a, a modeler, and he, and he he thinks if you just look at what's happening in the U.S. with natural infection and what looks like the projected rollout, he thinks perhaps by March that we might be able to get to the 60 percent total if you look from if you added the infection with the vaccination. Uh, Dr. Fauci is a little bit, I think, more conservative. He's saying more like the fall time. So, um, you know, somewhere in that range is what we're looking at. And, you know, in Guam, we have to get, uh, you know, if, if we're at 30 percent, we need another 30 percent um, uh, to be vaccinated. And, and you know, that's going to be, you know, 40, 50,000 people that need to be vaccinated for us to get to that level. If we, you know, are, are, if we keep these low levels and there's not a whole lot of new natural, um, that's what we want because we don't want more people dying um, and we don't want to overwhelm our resources here. Um, even if we use all this initial batch of the Pfizer and Moderna vaccine, we actually still have qu quite a long way to go there. Um, the uh, Chris sent me the um, uh, PHSS um, uh, surveillance data for the hospitalizations, mm -hmm. and, and he, he asked me if I could just do a quick rundown of that. So I wanted to just go through go through a few things here. The blue here is the cases, and the scale is on the left for the cases for hospitalization and deaths. The numbers are on the right. So you can see most of our cases, as you know, I think everybody knows, are mostly in a younger population. Thank goodness, because you're more likely to be able to survive. Our uh, hospitalizations, our, our biggest group that were hospitalized were in their 60s. Our biggest deaths were a uh, number of deaths were also in their 60s, um, and you know that we we know that it's going to affect older people more. Okay, but what's curious um, about this when I finally when I was able to take some uh, a closer look at this, you know, almost 60 percent of all of our deaths were over the ages of 60. Okay, now that's good, but it's it's quite a bit um, when you when you look at um, national data, 80 um, percent of COVID deaths are, are 65 and older. So we have more people dying in, in the younger age groups than you would expect if you look at, at numbers from other places. Um, uh, but thankfully, again, we have uh, quite a few, very few deaths in the, in the lower age groups. The case fatality rate, you know, this is the number of people that die uh, over the number that have it, that we know have it. So it's, it's diagnosed COVID. It's not the ones that we don't know about. So if you take, for example, this 40 to 49 age group, 0.76, that's, you know, less than one out of 100 people that are in their 40s will die. Now, that's still a lot, actually. And this is way higher of a, of a case fatality rate than you would necessarily expect, especially if you look at, at worldwide data. Um, as you can see, I, I did, I was able to find data for Spain, South Korea, China, and Italy here. And at least for the 40, 50, and 60, we are quite a bit higher. And this is almost 50% higher, which is a pretty big deal um, in these lower age groups. Now, Italy starts to catch up with us here when you get to your 70s and 80s, but the other countries are we're still quite a bit higher than these other countries, even at the higher age groups. So, um, you know, the, you know, begs the question, at least for me in my mind, why is our case fatality rate uh, in Guam a little bit higher for ages that are a little bit younger? Um, I think uh, uh, other people have covered this already, but we do know uh, from this data that that the two keys um, in, in general are, despite having a lower percentage of of our population, they are more likely to get severe disease when it comes to hospitalizations. And that is reflected here, the percentage of the population in green, um, but a larger percentage of our cases and a much larger percentage of our deceased. And you can, we can theorize as to why that's the case. Uh, perhaps um, a fear of coming to get medical care. Uh, maybe their baseline health isn't, isn't quite as good. Maybe the virus is being transmitted in their, in their communities more, more, um, uh, uh, with less uh, le less mitigation efforts, uh, those are the things that we speculate on. Uh, for most of the other other uh, ethnicity categories, you know, especially for the Asian Filipinos, it's pretty pretty stable across the board. Um, and the, on the local Chamorro population, went higher percentage in the Guam, lower percentage of, of cases and hospitalizations. Um, so um, I, I think I think uh, folks have talked about that, so I won't belabor that much. So. Um, and uh, you, that's also reflected here uh, in this chart. We'll just uh, um, skip over to the next one. So my, my kind of summary here is, uh, you know, Guam deaths, we, they appear to be more skewed to a lower age group than, than seen in the U.S. with a little bit higher case fatality rate. I, you know, my, my speculation here is um, maybe we have more co comorbidities in younger people than, than seen uh, elsewhere. Um, and uh, the other thing I'm, I'm curious, this actually might mean we're, we're doing a better job of sheltering our elderly population because they just uh, haven't we haven't seen the same expected number of deaths um, in that age group 
Um, and, and as mentioned, the Chukis have a higher than expected hospitalizations and deaths based on their uh, population in Guam. Um, this is a, one of the websites I follow and coronavirus, they sort of give a red, yellow, green. And um, Guam is the only place in the US right now that is in the green um, and everywhere else is red, even Hawaii has turned red. Um, and this is, they need to take immediate action is what they say here. So um, it's it's really dire in the United States right now. California, I heard in the, in the entire Southern California region, I heard there's zero, uh, there are ICUs that are 100% capacity right now and, um, and their, um, their cases are on the rise. So uh, it is a very dire situation in the US. Um, and the week to week comparison that I do, especially with age groups, we actually had, had a, 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 you know, not insignificant bump over the last week compared to the prior. And in particular, if you look at the age over 60, we had 10 over the last week, and this is uh, last week ending Friday um, versus the week prior to that. So we need to watch this closely. Again, this just speaks to the fact that we need to continue doing um, doing what we're doing, uh, what we have been doing over the last um, last few months. Um, the uh, the deaths expected uh, has plateaued and the deaths act will have plateaued. Um, uh, we had four deaths reported last week, whereas the prior two weeks there was only one. Um, so that's, a, um, you know, but that's not unexpected based on the number of people we have in the ICU. We still have seven in the ICU and, and you know, from what we know about ICU fatality rates, you know, we, you know, it's not, going to be unreasonable. I think we're, we're certainly going to have some more deaths from there. But with our low numbers now, which we're, you know, I think we're getting down to the 15 to 20 cases per day, if we can keep of those that are that are infected, if they're in the lower age groups, I don't think we're going to have a whole lot more. And there's a chance we don't have many more deaths at all for the rest of the year, which would be fantastic. Um, the uh, um, the curve, you can see this just matches up with uh, with the CAR score. It matches with uh, the, the JIC data, um, the, the uh, case positivity, the test positivity is down. Um, daily average for seven days is down. So, um, you know, big take home for me here over the last few days is that, um, you know, we need to watch this, this UK variant. Um, we need to encourage people um, uh, in, a, in a very reassuring way to to get vaccinated and um, uh, and uh, I think leading by example and, and by showing people, um, you know, by, by show, sharing good quality data with them about the safety uh, of the vaccine. And, you know, we really have to be, be comparing the risks um, of, of the vaccination with, with what we're seeing every day in the U.S. There's worldwide, there's like 10,000 people that die every day. 10,000 people die of COVID every single day. And there's been over 10 million deaths world, I'm sorry, 1 million deaths worldwide to date. So this is a, you know, it's, this is, this is an epidemic and, um, you know, let's hope that this, this variant that that's, um, uh, is not something more serious. Um, uh, and let's hope that, you know, when you talk about these mutations as well, I guess the last point here, you know, we know it's normal for the virus to mutate and, um, the more virus that's out there, the more mutations that are going to happen. Um, and so the sooner we can suppress the, the overall prevalence of this virus in, in, in the world, um, the less chances the virus is going to have to mutate to, um, to a degree in, or in, in a manner that's going um, to be more detrimental to, uh, to our ability to fight it off. Um, uh, I, I do believe that even if there were a, a major change, it would be fair, fairly easy for us to modify our vaccines based on what I've read uh, to be able to combat that. But um, I also believe that our current vaccines are going to be are going to be uh, adequate for uh, what we're seeing right now. Mm -hmm. So that's the that's the demo. I hope um, uh, it was a lot of numbers. I apologize. Um, I, was I hope it was clear. <laughs> Thank, thanks a lot, Doc. I I, I did want to ask about um, the 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 vaccine what sort of questions do you, do they ask you when you when you walk into uh public health um uh, well they'll ask you about uh, severe allergic reactions um they'll ask you about um major chronic illnesses they'll ask you if, if you've had the uh, the actual covid infection recently or if you have been exposed to anybody with a known covid infection recently so um i they they would, if you've been infected in the past three months, they would prefer that you wait. Um, it's not a hard um, uh, contraindication, but they prefer that you wait so that you can you can give your vaccine to somebody else. And we've only used 1,500 of that initial batch of almost 4,000. So we've got plenty to, to, to go around, I think, especially to the, to the healthcare workers that still haven't been vaccinated. Um, but the, I think that there's absolutely nothing wrong with, with using that uh, in, in the older populations. But um, yeah, those were the questions that I, that, that I recall. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I... I, I 
I sort of previewed already what, what was going to be asked. And so I, I knew I wasn't going to, I didn't expect to have any, anything that would be a flag for me not to be able to get the vaccine. Mm-hmm. And you said almost half of your staff got vaccinated? Well over half. Well over. And, and with uh, the folks that have actually had the infection, we're probably at over 70%. Now, I, I've heard of a lot of hesitancy, even within other clinics and um, uh, other other healthcare providers, even. And um, you know, I, I don't know what can be done about that other than just time and and reassurance, and them being able to. to th- Every person has to make this decision for themselves. They have to be comfortable with it. They have to, it has to make sense in their mind. Um, I, I'm going to be supportive of their decision, no matter what it is, um, and try to find a way allows it to make sense for them whatever whatever that is and again if it's a it's a safety issue i I just all i can do is point to to the data we have so far even even the data that we have over the past three days there's there's more than expected anaphylactic reactions than 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 what they found in the trial i think we're only um only two or three in the trials with with sixty thousand, and so far there's been i think more than expected um but you know, we knew there were going to be adverse reactions like this. We knew there were going to be anaphylaxis in some people that have an allergy to the components of the virus, and and we're we were prepared for it. And and it's one of the things that our emergency medical personnel are adequately uh, trained for. And and we're looking for it. Nobody's died of this so far. And again, you have to compare these risks, which are very very low, to ten thousand people dying every day of COVID. We've got to, We have. To, I mean, the, to me, it's like it's such a mountain of a difference in risk and and and, uh, more, and morbidity to uh, to the world. Um, uh, from that's and that's for me. But you know, again, everybody has to, has to be comfortable with this. And it has to uh, it, it has to make sense in their own heads um, before they're going to be comfortable uh, going through with it. But you, even I think um, all all the providers and, and healthcare workers that have had the vaccine posting videos and, and sharing their experiences. Hopefully, that that's going to help. Uh, some people, um, uh, um, again, sort of justify this in their own minds. Uh, doctor, we, we hear a lot about that allergic reaction. Um, and just to clarify, the the ingredient in the vaccine that is causing that reaction is a fairly common uh, allergic reaction for a lot of people, you know, uh, medicine and whatnot. So uh, for most people, this is probably a known allergy. At least their doctor knows about it, correct? Um, I don't know that I would say it's it's known for most people if they have an allergy to this. Um, it's it's actually probably unlikely that they've ever had a medicine before that had this component in it because it's not in a lot of medicines. It's it's in either there's an FDA list that I found that that showed all the different things that have this uh, this um, uh, this little component of the vaccine and and it, I, I don't think a whole lot of people would have known about this in advance. Um, so, um, you know, that part, I, I, I don't think that we can necessarily screen out for that uh, well um, if, uh, if, if they haven't been on, exposed to these medicines in the past. All right. Thanks a lot, uh, Doc. I, I think he's frozen. Oh. You're welcome. All right. <laughs> Merry Christmas. You're welcome. Thanks for having me again. All right. Always. Merry Christmas Merry and Christmas. Uh, uh, Happy New Year. Merry Christmas, okay. Doc. Bye bye. Take care, guys. Take care. All right, we're going to go uh, to a break, but uh, up next we've got uh, Wayne Paselli uh, with the Animal uh, Wellness Action Group um, to get his reaction to uh, this amendment <laughs> by 